right, before uh, Christian gives it away, um, I want to introduce him. Um, he is now a fourth year student at McGill University, but he joined us as a second year student at Mass General to do some research, and he really transformed our research program, made it much more efficient, and has done an excellent job, um, very tech-oriented student. So Christian, why don't you come up here and tell us what you did? Thanks so much, Lisa, for the introduction. Does everybody hear me? Can you hear me? A little bit better. So as Lisa mentioned, I'm a fourth year medical student at McGill. Uh, I also joined the team at the Mass General Hospital for the last two, almost three years now. Um, and I'm also applying to plastic surgery residency this cycle. I'm here with my mentor, Dr. Lisa Frere, as well as Dr. Jay Austin, who I think is around here somewhere. So we began looking into the mechanics of uh, manual chart review really out of frustration. As with any medical student, I you know, took on a few research projects and spent hundreds of hours poring over charts and looking for a predetermined set of data points to glean from each of them. Sometimes if we were lucky, and in the case of the Mass General, we were lucky, uh, they were digitized. Um, but at the end of the day, the goal is to apply a sound, strict methodology to every, cha to every chart uh, to ensure the integrity of the review. In my experience, this can take up the better part of a day, the better part of a week, uh, or on a large enough scale, the better part of the time you've committed to research. So in short, we believe there's a better way. We could do something better. And then we looked into it and found out that on a yearly basis, the U.S. Health, the US healthcare system produces on the order of 1.2 billion clinical documents. So this can be anything from an OR report to a clinical visit or a telehealth visit, really any form of plain text, either written or dictated. And I'll reference this figure periodically as we progress through the meat of the talk. We first began counting the cost of manual chart review during one of our migraine studies. We were investigating the impact of radiofrequency nerve ablation, we'll call it RFA, on patients who are undergoing migraine surgery. We wanted to understand if having a history of nerve ablation would make them respond either better or worse to the migraine surgery treatment. Manually reviewing the charts of these nearly 200 patients uh, who underwent surgery at MGH took nearly 23 hours, uh, or eight minutes per chart. Looking back, that eight minutes per chart must have been probably closer to 12 minutes per chart early on and gradually quickening to five or six minutes per chart by the end of the review. And I think we can, ch we can chalk up the quickening of the pace to a few things. The first is that, granted, Epic, the chart, um, the medical chart review that we are using, is a, a very powerful tool. As you gain proficiency with Epic, you can gradually get much quicker and much quicker and use some of the built-in features to automate your review. The other, which candidly, um, you know, I think every medical student is guilty of, the rigor of the methodology that you review your first chart with is very, very hard to maintain all the way through to the 200th chart, which of course compromises the quality of the overall review. Regardless, the premise of the talk today, really not to kind of bash or, you know, say any unfalsifiable things about manual chart review, it still remains a gold standard, but really to recognize the challenges that we faced, one, that it might be time consuming, and second, that there, you know, it might be prone to inter-reviewer discrepancies. At this point, after we, we spent 23 hours reviewing all these charts, of course, the logical next step and what we really felt like doing was to dive right back into them to figure out, you know, if there's a better way of doing this. And around the same time, I had been reading about a kind of programmatic tool called an auto clicker. Auto clicker can be as simple as 10 lines of code written to automate the mouse or keyboard functions of your computer. And recently, during the work from home era, auto clickers have kind of gained favor as popular alternatives to this. And they can, they can also be used to download huge amounts of content uh, from websites like Facebook or Instagram, uh, basically to automate extremely repetitive tasks in your day-to-day -day computer use. And this was when we began to calculate how much time we'd actually save in the chart review process by automating the simplest and most repetitive, st most repetitive steps of the process. Basically, trying to distill each step down to a basic sequence of mouse clicks or keyboard strokes. The first auto clicker we designed um, simply took in a patient's medical record number and output their name as well as their most recent clinical visit to MGH. 
Of course, you know, this was all password protected and all outputs were still stored according to our kind of compliance and according to the ethics filing that governed the particular study we were working on. Of course, also, it required that I supervise the monitor as the mouse clicked through the list of patients and collected a predetermined set of data points. And with each new auto clicker that we trialed, we added new layers of complexity. Firstly and most importantly, we wanted to make sure that Epic's password protection were preserved in accordance with the hospital's policy on accessing health records. Bypassing any kind of login process um, behind which patient health information was stored would have compromised the project and it would have been catastrophic. Back to the migraine patients, this was the first use of chart sweep. We designed a clicker to identify the patients who had undergone the nerve ablation before migraine surgery. And in comparison with manual chart review, this saved us more than 20 hours of review time, with each chart being clicked through on the order of 20 seconds. And it was at this point that we began to use the term chart sweep. We deployed the tool across several, several other chart review tasks, including patients who self-reported symptoms of thoracic outlet syndrome and patients with breast implants who ended up developing implant illness or ALCL. Across the largest cohort we tested our tool on, more than 1,000 patients, ChartSweep could scan through a record in six seconds. At the time, I think it would have been reasonable to ask about the use of billing codes as an alternative to our tool, as an alternative to ChartSweep. In theory, this is true, and I agree. Physician billing is a totally reliable proxy for conditions a patient is followed for or treatments they receive. The caveat, however, to this rule-based review is that codes are actually often entered by administrators and the codes themselves can end up being generic or too non-specific to capture the crux of what you're really looking into for the study. For example, in our practice, migraine surgery can be billed as a generic decompression, a nerve decompression, meaning that the cohort defined using this code may include patients who underwent miscellaneous other nerve decompression surgeries. That said, billing still can be a useful adjunct to manual or rule-based automated review, and it can successfully define some cohorts depending on the diagnosis or procedure. And of course, I think we should acknowledge ChartSweep's meaningful limitations. Importantly and firstly, it does have trouble accessing information and documents that have been scanned into the medical record. On most EMR platforms, this text is not searchable, it's not easily referenceable, almost as if it were handwritten. The way around this would likely require layering in some convoluted artificial intelligence technique, and we actually haven't found a way around this yet. And this is beyond the scope of our application. Second, distilling down the tasks that we're looking to automate is actually quite a bit harder than we sometimes assume. As an example, when you try to open the health record of a patient who might be affiliated to the hospital or who may be a, an important person or someone who was deceased, Epic pops up an extra prompt to enter a password and a justification for wanting to access the record. When reviewing manually, this is not a problem. This is something you just do automatically and you don't think twice about. There's no latency between inputting your justification as research and gaining access to the record. However, from ChartSuite's perspective, if the 87th, 500th, 1100th patient is an affiliate of M MGH or an employee or a deceased person, the program crashes. And again, we haven't found a way around this yet. And of course, despite all the limitations, uh, the tool has served as a practical and kind of quirky way to make things run a little smoother on a few of the studies that we've been working on recently. Importantly though, this should still be thought of as a surface level solution. We made no alterations to Epic or any other of the EMRs that this has been trialed on. ChartSweep can only go as far as the data structure it is working with will let us go. So that brings us to the future. What does the future look like? How can we take research automation to the next step for the benefit of patients, specifically in the context of plastic surgery? We mentioned that most medical records these days are digital, with the main benefit being that we no longer have to carry around the physical chart with us in our day-to-day -day work. While this is exciting and really does open quite a few doors, including the development of a tool like ChartSweep, if we really want to get the most out of the data that we're using, it's not enough that it simply be digitized. We need the data to be structured. In many ways, EMR providers such as Epic are already doing this. Think of the first page you see when you open up a patient's medical record. You'll have access to lab values, recent visits, pertinent information, and diagnoses. You get a quick summary of everything you need. Unfortunately, this doesn't yet exploit 
all of the information contained in the medical record. It might miss important features from the history, such as when a medication was stopped or started, adverse reactions to medications, important parts of the family medical history, failed past treatments, really anything. Anything contained in a, a soap note or a clinical visit. In the artificial intelligence engineer's world, ideal world, every tidbit of clinical information contained in the unstructured part of the medical record is captured and structured automatically. For those with data science experience, you know that basic clickers or rule-based automators that we've used here won't perform that well on these tasks, but that they would be extremely well suited for natural language processing. Natural language processing is the subfield of artificial intelligence that concerns itself with structuring and e extracting meaning from plain text inputs. In its current form, this would involve an algorithm reading text and interpreting every unique term it contains on an XY graph based on the context in which the most frequently used terms appear. For example, a 2D graphical representation of a Harry Potter novel might find Harry, Ron, Hermione, the three names of the main characters, cluster together as their names frequently appear together and in similar contexts throughout the text. And the same can be said about Gryffindor and Slytherin, both residential house names in Harry Potter. The name Draco Malfoy, the interesting one, and an early antagonist in the story, this should by no means be a spoiler at this point, would appear somewhere between the names of the protagonists and the term Slytherin, his own residential house. The AI can elucidate the relationships pretty quickly using vector geometry, and the details are well beyond the scope of the presentation. For reference, here is what it would look like to plot every term in every PubMed index abstract from PRS Journal and PRS Global Open. And here would be the clusters around the terms relating to anatomy, pathology, and treatment. In the healthcare space, the applications of this type of graphical representation of, of plain text are endless. So back to the figure. These 1.2 billion documents are not all created equally. They vary in terms of length, style. You can have soap notes, admission notes, operation reports, with so much critical, critical information that is trapped in these documents. Taking a step back, with a discharge summary, for example, how do you extract information from it reliably, consistently, and in an efficient fashion? This is certainly not a problem that's going to be going away, and data is accumulating quickly or more quickly every year. Currently, the best research data is actually coming from billing data, which we talked about earlier, not from real patient data. By re-engineering this approach and thinking of patient data contained on the medical record as the ground truth, we can begin making the most out of it. What if we began by inputting raw text from a medical record and extracting a few basic entities using a simple search function? These would include medications, medical conditions and diagnoses, signs and symptoms, tests, treatments, procedures, from a surgical standpoint, anatomy, and protected health information such as name, age, and address. With an exhaustive enough word bank, this is not actually that challenging. ICD and CPT codes are a really good starting point to build out a word bank of diagnoses and treatments. The next step, which begins to rely on AI and natural language processing, is called relationship extraction. You train an AI to recognize common medication dosage notation, test results, and imaging studies, and you slowly start to derive more meaning from basic plain text. The final step, conveniently the most challenging, involves extracting meaning from the modifiers. The patient is not taking Tylenol. The patient denies having taken Tylenol. The patient responds poorly to Tylenol. Ironically, this part is actually least tied to the healthcare-specific documents that we're working with, meaning that clever people outside of healthcare, studying NLP, and other fields have already taken care of most of this for us. So if we begin here, Donna, a 62-year-old female, underwent a bilateral breast reduction seven days ago. Postoperatively, her pain was well controlled with Tylenol 1 gram, regular for 48 hours, and then as needed for 14 days. Dilated PRN times 15 tablets. As a first layer, we've quite easily seen Donna, 62-year-old female. These are her personal health information features. And then, onto anatomy, diagnosis, and time frame. Bilateral breast reduction being the procedure, seven days ago being the time course, and pain being a new diagnosis, whether or not she has it is still up for debate. We move on to medication. Medication, Tylenol, is quite easy to recognize. Understanding dosage, one gram regular over 48 hours. And you guys start to see the trend. If you distill each of these tasks down to individual search functions and individual terms to recognize, it becomes much easier. 
And of course, the most challenging, well controlled. We've now recognized that the diagnosis of pain is well controlled and certainly not a concern at this time. So what is actually most exciting to us are the use cases. The first one that comes to mind is revenue cycle management and coding. The challenge with medical coding today is how siloed it is, meaning you might have an expert in ER coding, oncology coding, operating room coding, and with hospitals that are months and months and months behind in their coding, spread thin as ever, in many cases coding is getting outsourced to untrained administrators, this type of tool might be a useful adjunct. Next, of course, is for research purposes. When you use a natural language processing tool to analyze your medical record, medical record, what you're really doing is distilling that thick set of documents down to a table of entities and relationships between them, and you can structure your data. A SOAP note, for example, might become a set of three new symptoms with relevant chronology, two pertinent negatives, and a medication dosage or frequency, all structured in the context of a table. The novel operating technique that you described at length in the op report instead can be stored as a step, as a series of steps um, of anatomy and, and manipulation in tabular format that can then be called on later in seconds. Basically, using natural language processing will allow for the entire medical record to be accessible in summary format. So when you recruit patients for a clinical trial or a clinical study, instead of relying only on that set of patients that you can intake with your very specific forms or in a controlled environment, it turns out you now have access to patients across your network because the information is structured consistently across all providers. Structured data also makes it easier to follow patients long term. In the migraine surgery at practice at MGH, for example, the patient undergoes surgery at time zero and can be followed for five years or more with specific surveys administered yearly to elicit specific data points. However, these patients might actually be seen multiple times throughout that year between surveys with valuable information stored in the unstructured progress notes created on each of those visits. Structured data is actually easier to produce passively, but is also more actionable. The same applies for post-operative complications, adverse events, and most other pieces of data that a medical student would ask to capture retrospectively with manual chart review. Thank you.